Good evening from New York. I'm Chris Hayes. I hope everyone has been enjoying their holidays. I know I have. It's good to be back. And while I was gone late last Thursday night, just before the long holiday weekend, as everyone was immersed in their preparations for it, the January 6th committee went ahead and did it. They published and released the long-awaited final report, product of 18 months of work, nearly 1,000 pages long. The parts that I have read are shocking and revelatory laying out the crimes of Donald J. Trump and his co-conspirators in a clear and dramatic fashion. Crimes for which one of the authors of the report, Congressman Jamie Raskin, told an interviewer Trump, quote, could spend the remaining days of his misanthropic life behind bars, presumably with Secret Service agents. It's sort of a crazy image to imagine, a fairly bold statement from someone who is usually fairly measured. So what makes the report, what in the report makes Raskin say that? Given the holiday and the sheer volume of material, those of us who haven't read through it all can be forgiven. I assume, maybe I'm wrong, that you're in the same boat I am. And that's why we've decided to spend this week going through the final report here with legal experts who have read it closely. Now, there's obviously a ton of information we're going to get to throughout the week. But we want to start tonight with a particularly revealing section. It's not the first one. In fact, it's Chapter 5, which is titled A Coup in Search of a Legal Theory. Now, that title is important because it outlines exactly what Donald Trump and his allies were doing in the days leading up to January 6th. The point is, they had an end result in mind, a coup, the first in American history, the first time that the sitting president would overturn the will of the voters. They wanted to declare the loser of the 2020 election, Donald Trump, as its winner. How to do it? Well, in order to do so, they manufactured a bogus legal strategy to justify that conclusion. And that bogus legal strategy was known to be bogus to the key players, including this man, the man who's at the center of it all, a strategy that was concocted largely by this individual, Trump lawyer John Eastman. Now, we have mentioned him countless times. We've covered him closely on the show because he was such a key player in this entire undertaking. Eastman claimed that then-Vice President Mike Pence had the authority to essentially, unilaterally, by himself, as if endowed with supreme power, throw out the results of the election, essentially, to just say, no, I don't accept it, and install Trump as a winner instead on January 6th. Members of Trump's own inner circle, lawyer after lawyer after lawyer in the White House and around Trump, called it, quote, insane, crazy, and nutty. And what's clear in the final report, is that Eastman and Trump, as kind of partners in this undertaking, knew the theory was bogus, that the strategy was plainly illegal all along. There was no good faith confusion, no arguable, colorable case on both sides, no. In the presence of Pence, Eastman even acknowledged the plan was unlawful. And yet both he and Trump relentlessly pressured the vice president to follow the illegal plan on January 6th, that is, to break the law to break the law in a fashion they knew would be broken and thereby break American democracy itself. At one point, and this is really a key part of this chapter, at one point, Trump's sympathetic congressman, Louis Gohmert of Texas, tries to file a lawsuit in which he takes Eastman's own theory and argues it in court. He wants to argue Eastman's own theory of Pence's powers. So what does John Eastman do? Eastman himself lobbied against the Gohmert suit because he rightly expected a judge to declare Pence had no such powers, as was obvious to anyone looking at the situation. In other words, Eastman didn't want to test it tested in court because he knew it would fail. He didn't want a ruling on its legality because he knew it was illegal. He knew exactly what he was doing. That said, Eastman and Trump, knowing that in tandem, pushed the bogus legal theory anyway, both in the media directly to Mike Pence himself, who faced enormous pressure to go along with the scheme. To his credit, he did not. That doesn't change the fact that in just one of many examples, Trump and his fellow coup plotters tried to criminally subvert the will of the American people and potentially end American democracy as we know it. Joyce Vance served as U.S. Attorney for the Northern District of Alabama. She is now a distinguished professor at the University of Alabama Law School. And Renato Mariani is a former federal prosecutor and a legal affairs columnist for a political magazine. I know both of you have read this chapter of the report closely and have a lot of thoughts on it. Um, I am just getting up to speed, so it is great to have you here. I want to start on this point, and then we'll broaden out, because I, I do think this is a bit of a smoking gun. 
as pertains to the, the, the state of mind of, of Mr. Eastman. And I'm just going to read about the Gomert suit here and get your reaction to what do you think it indicates. Um, reading from the report, one of the President Trump's congressional allies, Representative Louis Gomert, pushed a version of Eastman's theory in the courts. Although the Gomert suit was premised on the same theory Eastman advocated, Eastman did not agree with the decision to file suit. Eastman argued that filing a suit against the vice president had close to zero chance of succeeding, and there was a very high risk the court would issue an opinion stating that Pence had no authority to reject the Biden certified ballots. Joyce, what does that say to you about the nature of Eastman's knowledge and corrupt intent with regards to this legal theory? Eastman knew, Chris, it's exactly the way that you explain it. He knew that that legal theory could not hold up in court. He knew that the vice president wasn't vice president wasn't what they called the president of the Senate, really the dictator of the American people, right? The guy who can throw out all of the legitimate ballots and declare the winner to be whoever he wants it to be. So the theory was a non-starter, and that's what happened. A federal judge threw out Gomert's case. The Supreme Court refused to take it up. What Eastman is really doing here is sort of this insurrection version of the adage that many government employees use. It's easier to ask for forgiveness, to beg for forgiveness, than to ask for permission. He knew that if he asked for permission in advance, he would be told, no, this is not a sustainable approach. And so what Eastman was doing, and by extension Trump, they were trying to play it out for as long as possible to keep alive this notion that the vice president could take the responsibility for throwing the election into controversy, hoping that, as they always did, they could take advantage of the chaos. Renato, Eastman's role in this chapter is... Um... Well, it, it comes across as more willfully malevolent than any other comprehensive characterization of his actions. What, what was your takeaway about Eastman's specific role and his specific culpability? Well, one thing is, I think, absolutely certain is that, as Joyce said a minute ago, Eastman knew that this theory was bogus. He also, at times, made false statements, and it was clear to me uh, from reading the report that he wanted false statements to be made uh, in relation to the scheme. I mean, one thing that is really important that's mentioned many times in this chapter, Chris, is that the actual electors themselves weren't actually submitted by the states. So in, in any, and there was actually no colorable argument that, that these states had actually submitted an alternative slate of electors. And yet Eastman was trying to get the vice president to say something false about that. And so it just goes to show um, that he had a scheme to try to whether you call it defraud the United States or make a false statement in a federal proceeding, these are crimes that are prosecuted on a regular basis. And that's why Eastman, uh, for example, uh, has his phone uh, seized by the you know, United States Department of Justice. Wait, say, follow, just to follow up on that, when you say Eastman wanted to make Pence to make a false statement, what, what, what was that? Explain that. He wanted Pence to say that there were competing slates of electors in these states. The problem that Eastman had is the states themselves refused to do it. I and mean, we all heard <laughs> Rusty Bowers, for example, from Arizona, you know, who testified to the committee saying he refused that. That is discussed in this chapter. But other states as well, uh, as the committee put it in the report, those state officials upheld their oaths and were unwilling to certify fake electors. And so essentially, the statement he was asking Mike Pence to make was, in fact, false on its face, regardless of the legal theory. This is such an important point, Joyce, that Renata makes there that really comes through in the chapter is they tried they tried it to do it at the state level. Right. What they wanted, the original plan, which was slightly more more defensible, though, obviously still essentially an insurrection, right, essentially a, a coup, was to get the states themselves to send competing electors. That never happened. And so they still tried to run the play, even though that first part had never happened, which to Renato's point, there does seem like clear violations of, of law in attempting to do it anyway and attempting to get Mike Pence to do it anyway. Yes, I think that's absolutely correct. And the whole story here, this is a whole trajectory about trying to use the big lie about voter fraud to somehow overcome the result of the election. 
And so, Trump, you know, I think about it as a funnel. At the big end, you have Trump filing all these crazy lawsuits, trying to get state election officials to overturn their, old, their own results. And everyone is saying, no, we're not going to do that. That's the wrong thing to do. They try to go to DOJ and get DOJ to put its uh, gravitas behind the voter fraud theory. DOJ refuses. And now we're down to just the last few days before the certification of the vote. And Trump is really down to two strategies. One is Mike Pence and one is outright insurrection. And so everything becomes focused on Mike Pence because these efforts with state electors have failed. To your point, Chris, whether or not there are crimes that are committed along the way, the statute that we've all heard a lot of talk about and that the committee referred on, uh, this interference, this obstruction of an official proceeding statute appears to be almost tailor-made for the conduct that occurred on January 6th.